Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see so many people having such a good time so early in the morning. Welcome to the latest edition of Offutt School Presents. I'm Brewer Duran, Dean of the Concordia College Offutt School of Business, and I'll be your host this morning. We're delighted to welcome Doug Baker, Chairman of the Board and CEO of Echolab, as our speaker this morning. We look forward to hearing from him after our breakfast has been served. Founded in 2012, the Concordia College Offutt School of Business continues its work to provide a premier undergraduate business education focused on global understanding, entrepreneurship, ethics, and leadership. It's an exciting time for us. We have lots of little announcements to make, some big. Um, we've just completed the Park Technology Center and students are now taking classes there. It's a huge step for us in terms of our finance program, but also analytics, market research, and a number of other areas. Our computer science degree program is off to a terrific start and applications for that program in its first year of actual applications are through the roof. Next week, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of healthcare administration. And if you look around the Twin Cities, you will see at the top of most healthcare organizations a cobber who came through that program. We're so proud of that program. And in addition, we are thrilled to announce that we will be launching a new executive education program in May. This program will feature intensive two to three day short courses for mid and upper level managers who aspire to the C-suite. I'd like to take a moment to recognize some notable members of our audience who are present today. First, from our Board of Regents, we have Corey Holland, uh, Chair of the Board, Randy, Randy Bochak. On his way. On his way, okay. <laughs> and Pastor Jennifer Nagel, who will deliver our invocation. Also in attendance are Office School Global Leadership Council members Chris Mason and Lowell Hellervik. Uh, there he is. Please join me in thanking them for their leadership. I'd also like to thank Echo Lab for bringing an entire table of Concordia alumni who also work there. Before we begin our breakfast, I'd like to call on Dr. William Kraft, President of Concordia College, for an additional greeting. Good morning. Oh my goodness, it's good to see all of you here at this early hour of the morning. I grew up in Pennsylvania where we never have events before 11 a.m. And so uh, I trust that you'll forgive me for whatever I'm about to say. It's great to see you and to add my uh, greetings to Dean Durans uh, on behalf of Concordia College and uh, the Offutt School of Business. I also want to add greetings on behalf of the Concordia Language Villages, uh, our, uh, our sister branch. Uh, their National Advisory Council met uh, in Minneapolis yesterday, and some of them are here with us this morning as, as well. Uh, as you know, uh, the Language Villages uh, are the uh, premier uh, opportunity for pre-college students uh, to learn a language, uh, not only in the United States, but in the world. Uh, but you may not know that this year uh, the Concordia Language Villages was named one of nine national language training centers for the Department of Defense. Uh, one of nine in the United States and so we are training Defense Department and military personnel uh, in um, up to six languages uh, in uh, ISO immersion and very excited about that opportunity for them and, and for us. Uh, our great thanks to Doug Baker for leading our session this morning, and to Concordia grad and uh, my friend Mark Jordahl for marketing, uh, for moderating this morning. Thank you both uh, for, your, for your work on our behalf. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again uh, to focus on issues of interest to the business community in the Twin Cities, and also uh, to focus on Concordia's commitment to educating students who will be ready to join uh, the workforce uh, that we know the world will demand with the agility and the skills that the liberal arts provide. 
At Concordia College, we offer learning that integrates classroom discovery with uh, the challenge of taking on unscripted problems that we encounter in the real world, in our communities, and in work, learning that recognizing that excellence stems from an inclusive culture, and learning that recognizes that uh, we do this for the greater good. At Concordia, we believe in the radical love of neighbor and the work that we do together in the world. These are the hallmarks of a Concordia education. I'm delighted now to introduce Pastor Jennifer Nagel, uh, from University Church of Hope in Minneapolis for uh, our opening prayer this morning. Jen is a 1994 alumna of Concordia College coming to us from New Ulm uh, in, in Minnesota. She holds her Master's of Divinity from the University of Chicago. Prior to coming to uh, Hope, Jennifer served at Salem English Lutheran Church, Central Lutheran Church, Hennepin County Medical Center. She served in Africa, uh, and uh, in outdoor and camp ministries as well, and on the Central Committee of the World Council of Churches. Jennifer's spouse, Jane McBride, is pastor at First Congregational Church of Minnesota, United Church of Christ. Jen, Jane, and their daughters live in North Minneapolis. Please welcome Pastor Jennifer Nagel. Thank you, President Kraft. Good morning. Good morning. So recently I received in the mail a book, a padded envelope with a book in, at my home. And most of the time my friends and colleagues don't send me books at my home. But it was quite a fun little surprise. And it's called The Seven Sacred Pauses. And it says underneath that, living mindfully through the hours of the day, as in the monastic hours of the day. And it came from a friend, a colleague, a fellow cobber, in fact. And in this little padded envelope, there was this note that said, blessings to you in your preparations for Lent. You'll be in my prayers. It's kind of a nice thing to receive. So I've been slowly making my way through maybe a paragraph at a time, whatever I can read in the evening before bed. And I stumbled upon one that made sense for today. This comes from these monastic hours, right? There are these different hours. Some of them are in the midst of the night. And then there's the early morning hours. And this being an early morning gathering, it seemed appropriate. Lauds or morning prayer. This is Macarena Whitaker, and she writes, This early morning hour, ideally prayed at sunrise, and it's close to now, is the first of the day hours and has praise and resurrection as its central themes. The dawn, too, has its sentinels. Rising early, they watch for the coming of the light. Perhaps on some mornings you can join the sentinels of dawn, as you too wait for the coming of the new light. I call this the awakening hour. So she writes all of that, and the truth is I have small children at home and my early hours are not always very peaceful. And some of you are working hard early in the morning already, and there's all these things that swirl around that maybe take us away from the early hours and the ways that the awakening hours and the prayer of the awakening hours might be powerful in our lives. And yet I love these hours. And I need this light that she speaks of. So I've been reading the lessons for this coming Sunday from Ephesians. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Live as children of the light. That's from Ephesians. And then I found myself in these spring days literally crossing the street as I walk around the University of Minnesota campus near my congregation, crossing the street so that I can be in the sunshine on these spring days. Have you done that? And then I've been sitting in meetings and feeling the warmth of the sun beating through the windows on my back. Light is coming. Light is coming. Annie Dillard writes, and Macarena includes this in the section about awakening. Annie Dillard says, I cannot cause light. The most I can do is put myself in the path of its beam. Causing light, that's, that's kind of grace. We, that's not our job. That's God's job. But putting myself in the path of its beam. That's the least I can do. The most I can do is put myself in the path of its beam. So as we gather today to ponder leadership, the lessons of leadership, and we think about that so often, I do at least, and I know many of you do, we don't cause that light. We don't cause that light, and yet in our lives and in our leadership, we can put ourselves in the path of its beam. Let us pray. Giver of this new day, 
Bless, O Holy One, our efforts, our successes, our failures, our second attempts. Bless this community as we gather our conversation, our learning, the insights. Bless our meal. May, O oh God, you strengthen us through this time. May that light be the light that we live in, that we shine forth beyond ourselves. We pray all this as we live and we eat. In Jesus' name, amen. Services at U.S. Bank Corp, including investment management, brokerage services, private banking, insurance, personal trust, and financial planning. Prior to serving in his current role, Mark served as Chief Investment Officer of FAF Advisors, where he was responsible for the management of mutual funds, institutional and high net worth separate accounts, and the firm's technology and operations groups. He led the investment group managing the First American Funds to multiple awards, including Lipper's Best Overall Fund Family in 2005, and Best Mixed Equity Group in 2005 and 2006. Prior to joining FAF Advisors, Jordahl was president and CIO of Ing Investment Management Americas, and prior to that was chief investment officer of Reliastar Financial Group. But that's not all he's done. <laughs> Mark was inducted into the Concordia Athletic Hall of Fame in 2005 for hockey and tennis. Jordahl was also the first recipient of the Arthur Ashe Award presented to the best overall representative of Mayak Tennis, who exemplifies scholastic achievement, sportsmanship, and service to others. He also earned academic All-American recognition. He played wing on Cobber hockey teams that reached the finals of the NAIA National Tournament in 1979, and that qualified for the NCAA Division III National Tournament in 1981. We're extraordinarily proud to claim him as an alumnus, and we're so thankful to have him moderating today. Please join me in welcoming Mark Jordahl. Thank you. That was nice. Thank you. <clears throat> wow, that was nice. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you this morning, and, and uh, let me add my uh, welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, so we have a we have a real treat for you this morning, and you at the Ecolab table all know this, but uh, uh, we have with us this morning Doug Baker, who's the chair and CEO of Ecolab. And Doug is really one of these uh, amazing individuals who leads one of the world's uh, great companies. Uh, he is really a, I'd say, a singular leader uh, in our community and all of this while being a dedicated family man and friend. Let me give you an example of what, what Doug has led at Ecolab. So Ecolab uh, provides safe food uh, and helps feed 45 billion people every year. Ecolab promotes healthy environments by cleaning 31 million hands. Ecolab ensures clean water by helping customers manage 1.1 trillion gallons of water. And it helps provide abundant energy by touching 45% of the world's hydrocarbon supplies. So Ecolab has amazing scope, and it's a global company, but it's, it's far more than that. Ecolab was ranked number six on Newsweek's list of world's greenest companies, number seven on corporate responsibilities annual ranking. Ecolab has been named to Ethisphere's list of the world's most ethical companies for 11 consecutive years since I think that ranking was founded. Ecolab was ranked on Fortune's list of most admired companies and Forbes' list of most innovative companies and Chief Executive's list of best companies for leaders. So all of this has been led by Doug, who has been CEO of this company since 2004. And I would say he's hardly been a caretaker CEO. Under his leadership, Ecolab has uh, closed dozens and dozens of acquisitions including the acquisition of Nalco in 2011, which, which nearly doubled the size of the company. 
Sales have gone from about $3.8 billion under his leadership to over $13 billion today. And so Ecolab today is a team of 48,000 professionals who get this done each and every day. So Wall Street has taken notice, and the Ecolab stock is up over 300% since Doug assumed the role of CEO. So for all this, Harvard Business Review has ranked Doug among the world's best performing CEOs. So in addition to his responsibilities at Ecolab, Doug serves on the board of directors of Target Corporation and U.S. Bank Corp. So he's kind of my boss, too. So. Um, and, and amazing involvement in the community as well, and I, I'd, I'd spend the rest of the morning if I talked about that. But among the things, if you're a football fan, the Super Bowl is here largely because of Doug, and he is co-chair of the Super Bowl host committee. So Doug's wife, Julie, joins him in many of these pursuits. They have three children. And uh, for those of us that uh, care about a liberal arts education and uh, something that seems to be increasingly challenged these days, uh, we can take great comfort that Doug's uh, amazing success emanates from an English degree at Holy Cross. So let's, let's give it up for that. <clears throat> and so maybe in a, in, in a more dramatic nod to the remarkable, uh, Doug was a varsity hockey player at Holy Cross. And... Uh, so I'd sort of put him at the top of a very short list of uh, highly accomplished hockey players. <laughs> so uh, join me, join me in, uh, in welcoming Doug Baker. Doug. Can I have that intro, please? <laughs> um, well, it's great to be here. I now know what a cobber is. So it's basketball season, and we were watching the other day, and Wichita State was playing. They're the Shockers. So I'm like Googling, Shocker. What the, is this like thunderstorms? What's going on? And of course, it's the way they used to talk about wheat harvesting. So you have a friend in Wichita <laughs> as you go down. All right, I'm going to do an inverted presentation. So you had some of the background. I was asked to talk a bit about the leadership journey, which is always interesting because you go, oh, you know, if you ask me about Ecolab, I can go through one of 55 presentations, pull it out, blow the dust off, right, freshen up the beginning and the end, and we are rocking and rolling. <laughs> but of course, that's not what you asked me for. You asked me for leadership journey. Now, that is not one that you have where you just got to blow it off and, and start going. You go, I actually had to think and go through. But I also had some help, and so we tried to make it somewhat interesting as we go through. And I would also say it's relevant because I end up getting a lot of questions. I have three children, as Mark mentioned, and they are all recently either in school, college, or out. And my youngest is a junior in college, and so she has friends, my boys had friends, and so you end up in a lot of these conversations walking through, and there's all this pressure on boy, has my kid got the right internship at the right time doing the right thing. None of this existed when, when I grew up. I mean, we were happy to get a job mowing grass. And in fact, probably wasn't a bad job to learn a number of things about business, like you had to buy a mower, you had to fill it with gas, you had to get Blanche Door, who was a really nice lady to pay you once in a while. <laughs> All this stuff. So anyway, I would just say, you know, leadership, I, and I think the journey is, is always a little less straightforward as it might seem. So I'm just going to walk through what I consider some of the things that I've learned. And the one is, it's clearly, I don't buy this ladder routine. And we get this a lot. In, in corporations, there are job titles and office sizes and the size of the plant you get and the number of squares and all this other garbage that comes, and people get really fixated on it. And the truth is, it's mostly about, are you learning? And are you in experiences where you're broadening yourself one way or another? Because at the end of the day, whatever job you end up in, it is how can you perform? And performance is based on skill 
development. It's not based on titles and all the rest. And we've all had emperors with no clothes and seen them. <laughs> and I won't even go there. But, <laughs> but it, it is really at the end, are you getting the experiences? And so I just say it's not really a ladder. It's this wild journey. And you've talked about some of it. And a lot of it is serendipity. It's luck. It's sometimes choices you make. Often it's choices you don't make. It's, it's a little bit random, but there are parts that aren't random, and so I want to talk about those as, as, as I look back. So I grew up in Minneapolis. I was a hockey player. Why did I end up at Holy Cross? Who knows? It was like the mind of a 17-year-old. I, I don't know. And, you know, as I went through school visits with my kids, you'd walk in, and in five minutes, they'd go, I don't like it here. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is it? And then, and then he would walk through the school, and of course, it was always who was doing the tour. And so for my boys, you know, the one was this beautiful blonde girl. I'm going, I go to Joy, they're going to like it here. <laughs> sure enough, this is really an interesting school. <laughs> so, you know, 17-year-olds aren't the best decision makers in life, and I prove that repeatedly, I would tell you. But I ended up going to Holy Cross. I was not Catholic, I was an Episcopalian, so I learned the Hail Mary during my first game at Holy Cross because I didn't know we gathered around the net. Hail Mary, Holy Mary, ha! Let's go kill those guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was part of my indoctrination. I'm now on the board of Holy Cross. I told that story and they kind of looked at me like, I don't think that's that funny. <laughs> So then I got out of school, and I had no idea what I wanted to do, and I ended up being, I never really skied, and I wanted to ski, and it was a long story. So I was a ski bum for three months, and that was fun. But then it was time to get a job, and my parents were completely freaked out at this point in time that they had a kid that was never going to find his way. And so I ended up getting a job at Procter & Gamble, and it was really the lowest paid offer I had, and it was not a job in one of the mainstream parts of the company. I ended up finding my way there in a couple of years, but I really joined the company where I thought I'd get the best learning and best experience. And so then I did make a good decision. It was the exactly right decision. I mean, the difference was 19000 in salary and 13000 So it wasn't small. And for me, it was kind of an easy decision because, you know, it's a marathon. I didn't think, like, the six grand spread was going to define my net worth. I didn't even know what net worth was. I didn't have a wealth manager you know, at the time. So, you know, as you go through. So anyway, and then, and then eight years I spent at, at P&G, and I ended up joining Ecolab. So that was now almost 28 years ago, 27 and a half years ago. I have a family. Here's a picture. And so my two boys are out. One lives in New York. One is here now working at Cargill Trading. And my daughter is a junior in college. And then Julie, who's been you know, an unbelievable partner in all aspects of life and also does a huge amount of community work because that's her passion she goes through. And then we have our dog, Bailey, who is next to useless. <laughs> so, so my story as you go through. And I would just say lesson one, I think it's really about experiences. And so I talked about the P&G decision, which really wasn't based on money. It was based on where did you think you would get the most experiences. And there's on other decisions, decisions like deciding to go to Europe and taking that offer and, and understanding that you were going to grow. And I would say, so our family moved there five months after we had our first child. Our second kid was born there. And it was a foundational experience for me for a number of reasons. We were fairly recently married. It was great for my marriage. It was great professionally. I had to learn a lot. This is back before the Euro, and so we were dealing in a you know, ridiculous number of currencies and a pretty small geography with a pretty complex business. But you started learning how do you look at the common things? How do you look at the stuff that's going to drive things? Everyone's talking about cultural differences. They exist. But if you sell more stuff to more people, your business will grow in every culture in the world. And if you don't, you will shrink in every culture of the world. So then the question is, how do I do that? 
and how do you get down to basics and what counts and what matters and start talking to the team about what we need to do and how do we look at opportunities, not obstacles, which I'll talk about, because the obstacles tend to define too many people's view on life. And so it was a great, great experience. Then we went to Greensboro, North Carolina, where we had bought a company. I was the first guy from Ecolab to land there. And this is a great little company that served fast food restaurants and did food safety and sanitation. And that experience is great because you were all of a sudden sort of the acquired. And it was a view of how it feels to be acquired. And there's too much of a conquering mentality of companies who acquire other companies. Like somehow they know more just because they had more money. And it's not true. And in fact, the only reason you buy another company is they know something you don't know. Otherwise, why are you buying them? If they don't have any know-how, technology, talent, market opportunity that you don't have, you ought not to be buying them. And so when you do buy them, you really need to understand what they bring and the strengths they bring to your organization and make sure you get that. But you have to have a different attitude. It can't be a conquering attitude. It needs to be a partnering attitude. And it needs to pay respect to their history and what they've accomplished. So they get to be proud of their history, you just want a common future. And not try to erase their history. You know, you will not wear our pen. Why? Because I said so. That's not the way you do it. You want people to wear the pen because they're proud of the pen. And so then you've got to create an environment that draws them in. And so these are experiences you learn, but you only really learn them because you're thrown in there. And so I always say if somebody offers you an opportunity and makes you nervous a little bit, geez, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be great at that. Uh, it's scary. I've got to move. I've got to do this. I say go. It is a way you're going to stretch yourself, learn, and push yourself. If you stay in your comfort zone your whole life, you will not maximize your potential. And I think we have an obligation. We get gifts. Our gift back is to live up to the potential and live up to our potential and maximize the use of the gifts we are given. And the other is you can't be afraid to look at yourself in the mirror. And there's plenty of opportunities to do this. So I had a 360 evaluation. So this is a great humbling experience. So I've take, I'm in K, I've just become new general manager after a couple of years being the understudy. K was a company in North Carolina. And I have this brilliant idea, I'm gonna fix the team. So I hire this group and they're gonna come through and we're gonna do 360 evaluations and we're gonna work and do this teaming stuff. And so I'm the brave guy, I'll go first. And so I go first and I get this feedback. And man, it was not exactly what I expected to hear. And basically what it was is a great gift because it was a picture of myself in a sense at my worst moment. And so you don't really get to see yourself there. And so it was kind of like this flash, like, you know, you saw a flash in the mirror of how you were when you weren't acting the way you wanted to. And that was grounding and foundational. It wasn't fun. I didn't like it. It hurt my feelings. Right? I had to figure out how I was going to deal with this. And then you learn, well, the truth existed before I learned it. It was already there. It's just now I know what everybody else knows. And so it's not new news. It's just new news to me. And, and I think you've kind of got to go through life willing to deal with what's the truth, even when it's uncomfortable. And it's no more fun now than it was then. This is never fun. And it's hard. But you need to be able to do it because I think leadership jobs in particular become so dang insulating that it's very easy to lose sight of how do you become better. And my team needs me to be a better CEO next year than this year, just like everybody in the team needs to get better. So the lesson three, I'd say over time, I had a um, great early boss at P&G Susan and Susan one time finds me in the office on a Saturday morning and I'm you know beavering away working on some stuff she goes oh what are you working on I said oh I'm just you know trying to clear the mail and this other stuff I'm just behind on it and she goes well I'll just give, give you some advice if you're going to come in on Saturday I would not work on your C, C priorities I'd only work on your A otherwise it's just not worth it now this is music to my ears because I'm the world's worst administrator I mean, I hate paperwork. I hate doing this. My email, I bet I have 1,200 emails in my box, but I get 200. I mean, it's, you can't possibly keep up. That's all you would do. 
And there really is no, I mean, there's satisfaction in having an empty email box, but you haven't moved one thing forward, by the way. Nothing got done. You just answered a lot of emails. And so are you going to work on the agenda that's going to make the biggest difference, or are you going to let other people set your agenda? And the other people set your agenda. I mean, I just, I saw an email this morning. Somebody said, you haven't gotten back to me on my last five emails. I mean, it's like an unsolicited email from somebody who wants to sell the company something. Yeah, and you know what? I'm not going to get back to you in the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, or 10th. <laughs> it's like, you know, just because you send me an email doesn't mean i got to drop everything and, oh, let me look at your new technology. I don't have time. Or if I do that, I'm not going to do the other stuff. And so it is being conscious about what you want to accomplish. So I'm old fashioned. I write like objectives for my quarter, like, you know, over a three month period of time. I write to do lists still. Okay, sometimes I write them on my computer, but you know what? It's the same dang thing. But I got to make sure do I get these things done or not? And they got to be on, you know, what is your personal agenda? And how do you not get knocked around by everybody else's agenda? It's very easy to do. And then finally, well, not finally, it's this obstacles versus opportunities idea. So I have a friend who's into racing. He convinced me to go to Bob Bondurant Racing School. Now, that was a blast, I have to admit. And it was right after I lived in Germany, so I had this huge built-in advantage, which is I was used to driving really fast. And it is an advantage. So I get to this school. We're going around. I'm having a ball, you know, lapping, going around cars. And then we stop, and they start talking. And one of the lessons they give us is they said, Hey, look, if you, if you see a wreck, look for the opening. Do not look at the wreck, because what you do is you steer your car where you look. And I'm going, oh, my God, that's kind of profound in a weird way, which is, you know, look for opportunity. I mean, if you sit there and stare at the obstacles, all you're going to see is problems, challenges. Do you look to the open space, or do you look at the kind of buttress right in front of you? And how do you think about that? And I think it's a great lesson in life and everything else. So we talked this morning at the convocation about, right, the light and sharing. And I, I think it is. Find the light. Find the, find the right space. But you have to go be willing to go look that direction and not look at all the challenges. So there's this other radio program I was listening to. And some guy says, you know, you, you can't wait in your driveway to leave until all the lights are green. And so often you're sitting in business and people are going, well, I'm not going to do this because we aren't ready yet. And you know, da, 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 da. It's like, oh my God, you'll never be ready. It will never be perfect. You'll never know enough. You know, some of this is set sail. And I believe momentum is one of the most powerful things in life. Keep moving, learn, move, learn, move. And don't be afraid to be wrong. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. I mean, you've got to go forward. And some of that is looking for opportunities and not getting so fixated on why it could fail. Start thinking about why it could succeed and figuring it out. And then all of life, I would say, is a team game as far as I can tell. But business certainly is a team game. And so if anybody says, what's the seat? Why have you been successful? And I would say, if I had any blessing, it was I naturally like to be around really strong people. I like to have people who are smarter than me, better than me at stuff, and I'm comfortable with that. And I was naturally comfortable with that. Some people, everybody says they are, but then you watch what they do. And so even on, I was talking to a CEO the other day, he wanted, you know, I want to talk to you about my board. Okay, let's talk about your board. This board's been there forever. So I go, well, they're not that strong. I really thought, you know, I wanted a board that I could manage. And I'm like going, well, I think that's exactly a crazy attitude, personally. You know, I, I want an unbelievably talented board who's going to go push me, who will fire me on Tuesday if I need to be fired. This is about the company. It's not about you. And it needs to be thoughtful. And you're hiring the board for your predecessor. So I inherited a great board. My predecessor did a number of great things, but one of the best things that he did was he had a really strong board. And so I got to understand the value of it, but also just the broad team. And do people hire people to work on their team who are going to challenge, push, take over for them or not? 
And the irony is people get stuck for one reason often. It's because they're never willing to hire somebody who can take over for them. They think it's job security somewhere deep in their right lizard brain. And it's not. It actually creates a huge problem for them because they can't get promoted. I mean, it is, it's probably deserving. I mean, in a, in a weird way, and I've had that conversation. You, know, you can't get promoted because you're unwilling to hire anybody here. And you know what? You probably deserve not to get promoted because you're unwilling to hire anybody and develop them. So it, it's a, you know, how do you want to think about it? And, and so I would just say the team part is huge. And then I'm a believer in high bars. So I've been CEO now almost 13 years. I've hit my sales target zero times. I am 0-13, heading for 0-14. <laughs> and I don't care. I mean, I, I guess I would, rather, I would rather shoot for 12, hit 11, than, than shoot for 9 and hit 10. And shooting for 9 and hitting 10 feels better, but hitting 11 is better. And so it's, you know, how do you want to think about that as you go forward? And there's all this, you know, I get into, I'm on a lot of campaigns, you know, leading the Dorothy Day campaign for raising money. And we had this conversation, you know, I don't care if we miss our number. Should we go for 35 or 40? Well, let's go for 40. It's more. If we hit 39, nobody, you know, God will forgive us. Right? It's okay. And if we go for 35 and hit 37, I mean, it's this mentality. I just go, more is better. We're trying to raise money for people who need help. So don't worry about this mental thing. I mean, let's just go, you know, how are you going to do the most good or how are you going to end up driving it? And then the, the best story I have probably is at K when we had to run this business. Shortly after I got there, after we bought this company, 65% of the sales of this company were McDonald's US. And McDonald's US, two months into our ownership of this company, calls us up and says, okay, we're gonna take half your business away, which is a third of the company's sales. If that happens, the company folds. Now you can't live, I mean, you know, well, it's only a third smaller. The whole thing, because you have this big factory and all this other stuff, it does not work. We would have folded it, kept the name, and moved it to St. Paul. So we had this huge challenge and at first you go through all the other stuff that a challenge presents. Oh my gosh, what about me? What did I do? I said yes to this job and here we are. And you go through this noise. And I would say there was, and this is normal, and everybody's going through it, the whole team's kind of wrestling through this stuff. And then one day I was looking out and you can see that little parking lot there, well it extends all the way around the building and so does the manufacturing facility. And I'm staring, and it was those rooms on the second floor, because that was our conference room. And I'm sitting there, looking out there, and you're going, and you look at all these cars, and the shift is changing, and they're all driving out, and new cars are driving in for the second shift. And then you go, you know what, this is ridiculous. This is, I'll be fine. The company fails, okay, we'll move, we'll figure it out. I, I mean, it's really isn't about me. It's about how the heck are we going to protect the 250 people who work here and honestly don't have other options. They aren't mobile. They don't have the education. They live in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is where this company's headquartered. Textiles all left. Furniture's all left. There really isn't other industry for them to go to. I mean, we're either going to save this dang thing and save their jobs or we're not. And the people who are really going to be hurt are those people. In learning that leadership isn't about you, but it's about others. And for me, that whole experience, which you know you say it was it was really years. It took us three years to save that business. And we we fought like the Dickens, started other businesses, and we ended up saving it. And our our one the last sole supplier at McDonald's US of all sole suppliers. And and so that was a success. But I would tell you. It's much more powerful when you understand why you're leading, and it's not for you. It's ultimately for those who you're leading. So it's a responsibility. And so I think one of my favorite quotes comes from Lincoln, and so it's not an exact quote, but he basically goes and says, you know, all men can handle adversity. If you want to test a man's character, give him power. And I think it's one of the more profound quotes, and what it's talking about is, is exactly this. 
do they, you know, do the people who end up with power end up understanding the responsibility that goes with it? And how do you wield it? How do you use it? How do you think about it? And are you thinking about using that responsibility in a way that's for the broader good? Which brings me to the last one, higher purpose. So we all live in complicated times and we all have to wrestle with many things. And I get asked a lot, because you know, CEO is demonized. I say sometimes that the hardest day was when I had to go back to my wife and family, explain that I'd been chosen to be the next CEO because you know CEOs get a bad rap in many places. You know, I'm sorry, I'm bringing shame to the family that, that now we will be CEO. So you go through, and let me say, it was not my wife's ambition to be married to a CEO. She could care less about any of this stuff. And, and so the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is, is you want to live this kind of integrated life. And I don't want to live where I go to church on Sunday and ask forgiveness or I do good deeds on Tuesday night to make up for the bad deeds I do all day. And there was a period where I was sitting in a large business conference and this wildly successful guy, he's you know, multiple billionaire, because he got up and talked about all the huge donations. He's been incredibly charitable, but he basically talked about it in those terms. He's a private equity guy. He's talking about it in terms of, you know, well, you know, I've made all this money and, you know, we didn't, you know, don't feel perfect about how we got there. And so I'm making up for it. And you're like, well, that's kind of a, you know, I don't get that. I don't want to live that way. And, and I don't think any of us do. And so I think we're all chasing how do you live an integrated life? How do you feel good about what you do during the day so that if you're doing more things at night, it's not to make up for the evil you committed, right? It's, it's in addition to. And so strive for a higher purpose. So we talk about clean water, safe food, abundant energy, and healthy environments is our mission at the company. And we want to do well financially. We need to, or the company won't be around long term. But we want to do it by doing good things and being a positive contributor to society, to our customers, to each other, et cetera. And to us, that's a hugely important mission. And so, you know, then you work to integrate this. And we don't have it perfect. We make mistakes. I do bad things. I say things I shouldn't say. I regret things I do. I'm a human. It's a journey, but I want to get better, and I think we all strive to be. And the company makes mistakes, and we do things. I get letters, and go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe we did that. And what do you say? I'm sorry. We're going to fix it, which is kind of what you expect your kids to say. Don't get into this denial nonsense. All right, we screw up. You know, I just, I didn't even look at it. It's some personal and confidential. I'm sure it's a doozy <laughs> from one of our 172 countries. Gosh knows what happened, but we'll figure it out and we will address it as we go forward. So our story is one of impact. We're bigger, we're financially successful, we have huge swath of large multinational customers around the world. I remember what the stat is. How many of the Fortune 50 are we doing? It's like, do you remember? It's like 30 or 40, I don't know. I mean, we a lot of the top companies we do business with, so when we talk about hydrocarbons, I mean, we take care of the water that comes out of the earth when you pull out oil. People say, well, geez, that's dirty business. Yeah, you know, we're going to use oil for a long time. I mean, I, I, I'm not for carbon in the air. I'm against carbon in the air. I'm also for feeding people. And right now, we don't know how that's the choice we have to make. And unfortunately, we need new technology. But in the meantime, if we're going to use carbon, we better do it in the way that has the least impact on earth. And we're going to use it for decades, unless one of you geniuses figures out the new technology. And it's not wind and solar, and I'm not your anti. It's just not. And nobody really thinks it is and knows the business just because of the scale. We need new technology desperately to go solve the challenges we have. And without it, we're going to be chasing our tails because good intentions do not solve environmental problems. Right? It doesn't happen that way. You have to actually solve the problem to make a difference on Earth. Earth doesn't give you no credit for intentions. It only gives you credit for what you do. So we want to do the best we can when we do it. So we have huge impact. We treat the water for 27% of the world's, or 22% of the world's power generation. We touch 27% of the food, 42% of the milk supply around the world. 
we do food safety in those environments. And so this is our mission. We work hard to do it. We work by leveraging technology and people to create value for customers. And if you're in a business to business, the only way you're going to be around long term is to do a great job delivering value. But customers have to trust you. And a big part of our business is getting our people to provide great service. And it only happens if they trust the company. They fundamentally have to think the company ultimately is working to do the right thing, even when we do dumb things. And so we make mistakes, but we don't want to be questioned on intent, if that makes sense. So I know, I know they try to do the right thing. They're just stupid. That's why they did this. That we will plead guilty to. We don't want to be, they're smart and evil. That's why they did this. <laughs> so we do work hard to make sure that that part works. And so I'm not going to go through business model, but I will spend one second on this. This is your educational moment. All right, world short on water. There's going to be a 40 to 50% imbalance between supply and demand if we don't change things that we're going to go do. The population's growing. It's going to go from 7 billion to 9 billion in the next few years. And the population's changing. So the middle class is still rising in Asia in particular. And as people move into the middle class, they change their diets. They have more demands in terms of they want refrigerators and they like electronics and they use more energy. Guess what? We did. Europe did. Asia wants to, should. There's some that say, well, you know, they shouldn't do that. They shouldn't eat meat. Well, everybody else started eating protein. Guess what? My bet is they will too. The challenge with protein is that just if you're going to eat protein, it takes a lot more calories to feed the world when you're not just eating cereals and grains, but you're also eating protein because you got to feed the chickens and before you kill them and eat them. It's inefficient. So the point here is this. Water is scarce, and there's going to be more food demand and more power demand, and the two largest uses of water are food and power. And so it's just going to exasperate an already challenged situation. And this is real. It's going to be real in the United States and big parts of the country, not in Minnesota. It's not going to be our big problem. We only have like, what, 6 million people and a lot of lakes. But let surface water not really fool you because most of the water is under the ground. But we're using it at a vor voracious rate. This can be a big issue. And so ultimately, these are the challenges that are going to face the next generation that we've teed up because we're not doing a great job solving them. We're trying, but it's not getting solved broadly. So California, they call it a drought. California's got a major mismatch between water and number of people and industry. It's not a drought problem. The drought makes it a little worse temporarily. They've got a fundamental mismatch between supply and demand. Huge problem. So what happens? They go through a drought. They do all these tough stuff. They reduce water consumption. You cheer them on. It starts raining, and they take away all those measures. They're right back where they started. That is a great education for the human race. We learn nothing. I mean, nothing in, in going through that. And so we think water is like some natural right. Water is finite. All the water that exists in the world exists in the world. It is not, there's no new water being created. It doesn't happen that way. And so it doesn't go away when you use it, but it does turn into salt water, which is not that useful. Right? It's tough stuff. So it's just, we need to educate ourselves. And the other, so I monitored you, GMO was the last thing I will say. Everybody now is somehow against GMOs. Nobody has any of the facts. We're just against them. Why are we against them? We don't know, but they have to be wrong. And I would just say we need a much more thoughtful approach because I will tell you the number one technology that we know of to feed 9 billion people and do it without cutting down all the forests are GMOs. So right now, if you're against GMO, you are for deforestation or starvation. That's, and that's the truth. I mean, those are the unfortunate truths. And nobody wants to deal with them. They go, I don't like that. I'm against deforestation. I'm against starvation. And I'm against GMOs. And so that's a happy place to live if you live in the United States, the richest country in the world or, you know, in, in size. But it's not going to feed the world. And it's going to create monster problems. And so I would just say, if we do anything, work to educate yourself and work to understand both sides of the issue. They're not that simple. 
and we do not want a billion people starving, and we do not want all the trees cut down, and we do not want to poison people either. But it is a much more complicated world than everybody wants to make it in our small headlines. So left accuses the right of being anti-science. I think they are. But I will also tell you the left can be anti-science too because they don't want to deal with the complexities of the issues. And so some of this needs to be much more thoughtfully looked at and much more thoughtfully pushed if we're going to solve the world's problems, which I think is our fundamental obligation. So I don't want conflict between what I do during the day. I don't want my people to have conflict. I want them to feel like they come to work. We try to financially succeed, but we try to do it by doing good things for society, do it the right way, and admit when we're wrong, or it's a long life. So with that, I'm done. Like, we haven't practiced this, so. Yeah. Should I just? Should I ask you the hard one first? Go for it. <laughs> so you, you talk about, so you have a company of 48,000 people, and you talk about, a, uh, you know, the, the team is what accomplishes whatever it is you accomplish. How, what do you look for in great leaders? Well, I do, you know, I do a lot of interviewing at, at different, at certain levels, but I think throughout the company, I think we want people who want to push, who want to put a, you know, thumbprint on the company, but who define success as succeeding as a team, not just personal success. Now, we, we do want, I mean, I don't think, you know, no ego is a problem and too much ego is a problem. I mean, you, you do want people who want to personally succeed and who want to live up to their potential. And so, you know, we need a level of ambition, but it's got to be defined, I think, not just as personal satisfaction, but as sort of winning as a team and as a group. And so we work very hard to do that. We're an extroverted company. We try to be externally focused. So you also need people on the team who like people. I mean, that helps. Do you, think, do you think a lot about culture? Yeah, 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 constantly. Yeah. And it's hard. I mean, we're, you know, far sprung. We do, you know, surveys of where are our people's heads and how are they thinking and, um, you know, one of the knocks we get, and, and, you know, I take it, is accessibility. And you're sort of going, okay, well, how are you defining accessibility? I mean, I can't, you know, open door policy. Okay, I can have an open door policy, but I can't see 48,000 people. I just had an email this morning from one of our um, route drivers in um, Canada worried about cybersecurity, and I'll, I'll tr I will get back to him. I mean, he spent a lot of time writing and researching. Um, that will be an email I do answer, you know, as you go through. But it's, you know, I can't answer an email from everybody every day or even probably be hard to do it once a year. So you try to think about how do you get leverage through the team and, and how do you make sure that the culture, i.e. the values that you want to drive, are um, driven the right way. Right. So um, it would, it would, you, you talk about momentum. And it would be, you know, when you're successful, it would be easy to kind of rest on your laurels. I saw you shortly after the Nelco acquisition. I remember thinking, you just bought a company that doubled the size of your company. That looks like an extraordinary risk. Talk about taking risks and, and how, how, how you think about that and how important that is to success. Well, I think we always underestimate the risk of not doing something. Right. right. I mean, I think we overestimate security in status quo, and, and as a consequence, you know, we see this risk delta as more significant than it actually is. And so that's one thing. And companies in particular, if you're not continuing to grow, increase the opportunity you're chasing, increase the technology you have to bring to your customers. Ultimately, if you start becoming slow on that, there's huge risk for the company, sort of like go out of business risk. Right. And people think big companies are safer than small companies. That's just not true. And the stats don't bear it up. Companies go out of business all the time. They get <laughs> bought, they get changed. And so that's one. And so I thought, you know, the Nalco risk to me, I mean, we got comfortable with a cultural fit. And, you know, as a company had been around since 1923, it had grown 
like 95% of the years it was in existence. It had just gone through a very tough 10-year period, been bought, spit out, bought by private equity, put back out in the public market with a ton of debt, and even through that period it grew. So you're sort of going, if they couldn't screw it up, we couldn't screw it up, was my philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you got to just sort of, I think, look at the big macro. Yeah. Yeah. Right? What do you think about a liberal arts education being an English major? Oh, it's the best. <laughs> I, I, um, and we were just laughing. Another one of uh, our mutual friends and a very good friend of mine is um, McLennan, who runs Cargill. He's an English major, too. So we always say we're taking over the world. <laughs> the... Um, I, you know what, I, my kids all um, went to liberal arts schools. And I think there's too much, I, I'm, I'm not against it at all. I mean, I think you can go to a business school setting and everything else, but I think if you don't include um, some of the classical liberal arts and what you learn in school is how to think and how to communicate, and those are the skills that are gonna carry through. I don't remember much about Beowulf. <laughs> Grindle, how's that? But I don't. That's good. I don't remember much about Beowulf, and it really doesn't matter in, in my day to day life. But the lessons about how to communicate, how to think, how to analyze, and how to creatively explore, I think were invaluable. So I'm a fan. Thank you, Doug. You Thanks, Thanks for being Mark. here this morning. You <clears throat>Thank you so much. On behalf of Concordia College and the Offutt School of Business, let me again express our thanks to Doug Baker and Mark Jordahl for a fabulous pro program and, and discussion. I'm so glad to know that the intersection of our lives was being ski bums in Colorado. Um, but I think what really came through in your talk was how much your philosophy is reflected in Concordia's educational foundation called BREW, Becoming Responsibly Engaged in the World. And our students will tell you we talk about brewing all the time. And so this was a particularly resonant talk for us. Many people have helped make this event possible, but we'd like to especially thank our corporate partners who've supported us today, our event sponsors, Echolab, Fontis Investments, RDO Equipment and RDO Integrated Controls, and U.S. Bank, and our table sponsors, Bell Bank, The Boulay Group, and Norway House. I would also be really remiss if I didn't also thank the hard work of Carol Hedberg, our event manager, for making certain that this event went off without a hitch. If you have suggestions for future speakers or are interested in learning more about ways to engage our students as mentors or with, inter at, or with internships, please see any of our staff after the program. If you would like to be on our mailing list for future events, please feel free to leave your business card in the bowl on the registration table as you leave. Finally, we invite you to join us for the next, next edition of Offutt School Presents in the Fall.